Frazier help us when something like this gets called. And just when you hear the word high water, I know a lot of people kind of freak out and they're like, oh my gosh, but if you work on the side where you have conventional loans and stuff like that, you know you don't get a second chance to get that price up. So this is actually a very good thing for realtors. I mean, you know, if you've got a conventional loan and the appraiser says, nah, it's not worth it, you don't get a chance to send a new promise and to do a bunch of stuff. So do be, you know, try to get that stigma off of it too. When you see a tide water come across, just know that that's your chance your second chance to get numbers in front of the appraiser and get that price up or where we think it needs to be and um, just help them out. So, I'm going to stop talking and we'll let you talk. Is that the same? Is working? Hello. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> All right, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Steve Swedberg. I'm a certified residential appraiser. I'm also a general contractor. Uh, and inactive broker, my wife's broker, um, exactly. Um, I've been asked to go over the tide water to help everybody work together, I guess, a little more smoothly, especially in these times where it seems like 75% uh, of the sales are probably in tide water. Uh, I'll go over first what I see from my end, <clears throat> what the biggest problems that we have. Uh, Appraisers do not create value. Uh, I think some agents feel like we should be able to get a value just because of the contract price. Uh, the biggest issue is we're supposed to use comps from the subdivision, from the neighborhood, uh, to record sales and market trends. That's our job for the lender. Uh, so what I have seen with the way our market went down in the early, or 2007, I guess probably in the last five years. The market is obviously a lot better today than it was, but how prices, you know, REO activity, certain activity drop prices to certain levels, and then people were able to buy those at a deal, and then the ages of pricing houses based on subdivision where a seller can make a few bucks and sell it, not really looking at the bigger picture of the market. Uh, we have plenty of subdivisions throughout the, the market that same developer develop, same house plan, same floor plan, same square footage. Um, <clears throat> when we're supposed to stay in a subdivision, but if you can go historically and see that prices in these different subdivisions were the same, you can sometimes use those as comps if they're more recent sales and they, they support the higher price. So it all goes back to listing the price in the neighborhood at the right price. Um, you know, we have to use those sales that are in that subdivision and with the technology today, lenders and banks, they have access to all the sales just as much as we do. And sometimes I'll get emails back from the lender asking me why I didn't use this common subject when I went somewhere else because I felt like it was a better sale, comparable or quality or, or whatnot. Um, so I think the biggest thing you can do on your end to help us is make sure when you're pricing your houses in your subdivision, don't be the lowest price to sell first. Price it based on you know other neighborhoods that have sold too that are similar within a few mile radius uh, because some neighborhoods are recovering better than others. That's where I see more problems. Obviously now we have multiple offers, over asking price offers on a lot of the sales. So that's where you know it becomes you know that house typically is the higher end of the market. So we have to find a trend showing that prices are increasing. Um, from the trends that I found it's about a 4.7% increase in the last 12 months. And so that's the adjustment that I make whenever I'm making a time adjustment on comps that are a few months old. So to help follow that trend of an increasing market. Um, <clears throat> but other than that, it's really, besides obvious, you know, pricing, you know, asking price that are over the list price, some of the problems that I found that the square footage is off. When I measure it, it's 200 square feet smaller than what the tax bar said. 
And so, you know, I let the lender or the, the agent know that, hey, you know, this house is smaller than what you marketed at, you know, try and help out, you know, with comps. But typically in that situation, there's not a whole lot of help because they've already priced it you know, based on that square footage. Um, I think that's about, that's about it for me. But that I should have questions. Yes, uh, coming in Ohio South, if you can't find a good comparables uh, uh, in a subdivision, how many miles out does the appraiser go? Oh. You know, the, the bank wants us to be within one mile, but we can expand it to five miles, 10 miles, whatever we have to. Okay. to. I mean, you know, if you have a unique waterfront property or something with acreage, um, you can expand the search. You know, I kind of, my philosophy is in this market, what is a typical buyer in the Jackson market? It's usually military that wants to be within 25, 30 minutes of the base. You know, so you, you can say a acres property in Maysville can be similar to an acres property in Richland or maybe south you know, southwest Jacksonville. So I would use, you know, if there's a unique property that requires, you know, me to expand and search, I feel as an appraiser that's the same typical buyer in the market. So, um, but typically, the banks, the lenders, they want it within one mile, five miles, without, they won't really question it within five miles. You guys have any questions regarding filling out the title? As, as far as like the adjustments, so when you said some of them want to get rid of them, some of them don't get it, lenders wise. Um, so, just wondering, as far as putting the information in there correctly, we don't know how much to do for a garage or a half bath or a fence and what's happening now out there at the market. Like you said, though, if you put a house on the market that doesn't blow as much as this flipper did, or it has a two-car garage, or it has a fence, and that's what I'm being told that we don't have a price point to make that adjustment to fight for our numbers. I mean, where do we go for information like that? You know, so we're supposed to get our adjustments based on paired sales and analysis. So you have a sale that has a garage and one that doesn't, you know, adjust everything else out, find out what the difference is. So uh, a typical adjustment that I've seen that I use a lot, 5000 per garage. Um, I have seen lately my adjustments have been going a little bit higher, um, up to 7500 garage, but that's kind of been a market adjustment in, in reviews that I've seen of other appraisers work, kind of an accepted number. Um, but I would say do your fill out your thing and do what you think. You know, the appraisers are going to look at it and either agree or disagree based on their information. Um, but that's a good educated guess to show, you know, to support what you've done. I think the biggest thing, you know, there's a lot of information here, and I would say that 99% of the time, not everything is filled out. Um, the VA wants this to be filled out in form like this. Now, I would say, typically, if I don't get it in the form, they just send me comps. You know, I, I've usually searched the market, and sometimes it's a comp that I haven't looked at, and I'll pull it up and look at it. But, you know, I'm going to adjust the set different than what they usually do. But, you know, there's some times where, you know, I, I've overlooked something in my search of square footage range or uh, quality to where, you know, it opens my eyes to another neighborhood that I may have not searched originally. Um, you know, when I do my search, if I pull up and there's 100 houses that pull up in my search, I keep narrowing my search until I get to a good handful that, you know, would be representative. But sometimes there's that, there's that one property that just sold last week that, you know, it is the higher end, and it's maybe another subdivision next door, but historically the prices were the same, so it would be the best call. And with that, this might a little bit of a question, I have a question, but I think like it shows you that per square foot, right? 119.2 or whatever. To me, isn't that kind of like, I don't know how to explain it. I don't agree with it, because you go into this neighborhood, and one's at 125, one's at 127, one's at 119. Granted, maybe there's a few more bells and whistles, but that's not supposed to account, obviously, for the huge square footage. So that would be something I'd love to see gone. Yeah, so the, that number is essentially just a the sales price divided by the square footage. Right. 
Uh, so it includes everything, the, you know, the quality, condition, the you know, site, you know, one property may have a couple acres. Um, but uh, that number's not very, you know, I've had some uh, realtors call me and say, well, this, this house sold for you know, 120 a square foot. You know, this one's selling at 119, it should work out. Well, you'll see the smaller the house, the higher the price per square foot, you know, so the bigger you go, the, uh, the lower it goes. Because as a builder, I build houses too. It's, you know, you have thirty-five, forty thousand dollars a lot. That doesn't change if I build a thousand square foot house or a two thousand square foot house. So same thing with a kitchen. You have a kitchen in each house. Sometimes a little bit more elaborate, but you know you're not putting two kitchens in a two thousand square foot house. So the price is inevitably going to go down the larger you go. And so if you're not within a very close range of square footage, those numbers can be way off. Speaking from regional and all that side, um, none of them. Chris, first work though is not part of Paragon, if you've been here long enough. I'm a 1995, that's why I feel like people. So, and then, Chris, first work, but, and again, you, a lot of this stuff is um, brokerage specific, like, you, you know, talk to your brokers in charge about how they want you to use certain things for CMAs and all of that kind of stuff. Sorry, this is one of my back too. You know. Um, but basically all that is, is to show trends going on. I don't think anybody should be using price per square foot or CMAs or anything like that. And that's you're really looking, like if somebody calls you and they're like, hey, you know, do you think I, what do you think my house is sell for me? You give them an immediate answer. I mean, maybe you could look at that, but I still wouldn't be putting my name on something like that. Basically, like you said, it is to show trends. We do a lot of new construction, so if you're looking at a real specific area, a real specific, obviously, same quality, all of that, in like a 200 square foot range, all one story or all two story, you'd be able to see what's happening in two different neighborhoods. Other than that, I don't know that I would use it a whole lot. Um, but it's just one of those things that you can, you can, you can ignore, right? It means nothing for the most part. And thus, you want it to mean something. If you're trying to get your point across to an appraiser or somebody else, and you think that will help you, God go with you. You know, yeah. throw it at them and just see if that helps. But it, it is very specific. It doesn't um, compare over a wide range. It just compares over real small ranges. But if you're in that small range and you do see that there is a trend that these houses all be 120, and an appraiser is giving you 111 for some reason. And they're real, like they're worth a whole lot of adjustments. Yeah, I, I like that. And I will say too something about construction. New construction. A lot of these buyers, you know, they're coming in and they're putting five, ten thousand dollars into their house upgrades. But the house then closes out at the base price purchase price. As an appraiser, most uh, like Bill Clark homes, other Bill, you know, Sandy homes, they would always include the every upgrade. And price so it, it does get a little confusing for appraisers sometimes because even the same house would be twenty thousand more so you got to watch that but my personal opinion being still kind of a gray area out there now is that everything should close out with what the person paid for because that's what the buyer that was going to pay and you know the buyer puts twenty thousand into a house today so they can say they bought it for two fifty they really got two seventy in it well that comp closed out two fifty they're already twenty thousand negative equity to be able to sell it in three years. Like that market can't never catch it, hardly catches up to that number. But where if they close it at two seventy now, an appraiser may say, "Hey, it's not a good comp; it was a custom mm -hmm. deal." You can do that, but eventually those numbers will start moving up faster to where that buyer is not totally negative equity into the property. Um, but I know that's something that's mm -hmm. coming up a lot. You know, to, you know, you guys are talking about it. Maybe talk we get uh, both sides. We get appraisers, not appraisers. We get lenders who don't. Basically, it, it's educating buyers though at that point because we're not telling you to lend that much money on it. But the lenders have a really hard time looking at that purchase price changing on an offer purchase by twenty thousand dollars, and they don't want anything to do with that twenty thousand. You can say it's all building deposit books; they've already paid it and all of that. But some of that's up to the lender too. If they say no. There, there are things we, we, we won't do it, but you know, definitely just the, the point of having classes like this, though, 
hard to see what all sides of that look like. Like, what is the most helpful for our market? You talk to people like Christina Asbury, she's going to say that our MLS, that its sole purpose is for appraisers. It has nothing to do with us, yeah, it's just information for them, so any data that you can give them. So yes, if there were upgrades or something like that, you know, not only getting that purchase price to match what they really paid, but also maybe, you know, putting in the remarks, what those were, because that's the question that I get all, you know, appraisers call us all the time, and they're like, they're screaming, of course, what's, what's happening with this one? Because, you know, what's the floor plan that's in the MLS is probably not how it was built. Yeah, and then, yeah, that's so real specific. Yeah, and that's kind of like, you know, if somebody put a screen porch, you know, you're going to spend you know, 10000 or more dollars on a screen porch. And so that should increase. Now, it's not always that it's going to get the value that they, their purchase price. They're going to probably have some skin in the game when they buy it and put a bunch of upgrades in it. But it will give them some of their money back. But it will show it should close out the number they purchased because that was what they the total purchase price. They put money down and they may have not gotten a loan for the whole amount, but it at least shows what buyers are, are doing in a, in a neighborhood. You know, because like Savvy Homes or Bill Clark, I mean, they'll give you a base price home, but nobody buys a base price. So what is true market value? If nobody buying a base price home, you know, then it shouldn't be a base price. Everybody's upgrading it because they just want the nicer stuff. I mean, and uh, so there's a happy medium. There's going to be the high end people that put a bunch of upgrades in, and there's going to be the people that do nothing. But most of the buyers, typical buyers, are going to be right in the middle where they're doing something. So I just feel like it, it helps, you know, helps the resales in the future. You know, we don't want to get to for years down the road and they're still negative equity and you can't sell, you know. That's kind of what got us into the situation we were in, so. Can we jump backwards real quick before anybody else has any questions? So we talked about kind of the, the radius that the bank directs you to kind of look at. Can you give us some of the other specific, like, like you said, you try to stay in the same neighborhood, but they're also supposed to have one. So yeah, so new, new construction, they require either a resale from the subdivision uh, or two from the subdivision, one from outside and similar, from a similar bill. They're not supposed to be the same bill. Uh, that way, developers and builders aren't price fixing. It's what they're trying to look for, make sure uh, the market is everywhere, not just one neighborhood. Uh, that's just for new construction. Once it's resales, resales are uh, you know, it's supposed to be from the same subdivision within six months if you can, uh, up to 12 months max for uh, any cost. But like I said, I mean, you know, I have seen, I just did one a few months ago, it was a high water, whole lot of cost from the subdivision. You know, and then when I'm searching, I mean, I just pull subdivisions, it's simpler, you know, 20 sales in subdivision in the last year, pull them all, and none of them came close to the purchase price, and it's a uh, high water. When an agent sent me over and said, hey, well, I pulled from this neighborhood here and there, and they were all comps that had sold within the last month. And it was, they were similar quality, maybe in the homes, and the same, same building built in the neighborhood 15 years ago. And so, you know, I explained it out, and it worked out for them, but, or it came very close to working out for them. Uh, but, you know, Having that, if she wouldn't open my eyes to those other couple of sales that I was, you know, when there was plenty of sales in the subdivision, um, I would have you know, been a lot farther off. But, you know, you look at the history of those two subdivisions, the history of, you know, sales there, you can just see every house that sold in the last few months sold zero or one day on the market. So those are indicators that the price, obviously, the neighborhood is too low. You know, you have everything selling above asking and it's zero one day on the market, then you have plenty of ammo to fight with somebody to say, well, you can't use it from the subdivision. You can prove that the market overall supports that value. Do you guys ever use any pending uh, comps ever? So pendings can be used as additional comps, comps four and five or six, uh, but none as one, two, three. One, two, three have to be close sales. And just real quick while you guys are looking through this, these are all things that I had printed out for you. This was, this was not from Stephen. These are just variations of things that lenders have sent me over the years. Um, some nicer than others. Literally the one that is, you know, she didn't print out the one that looks horrible. Uh, <laughs> that one is the one that I get most often from lenders. Um, but like you were saying, when you're filling these out, it doesn't, you don't necessarily have to fill out all of, of the randomness, but my point with if a, if a lender says 
into this and says an appraiser's asked for a tidewater grid, and I, I want to get that value if I'm a listing agent, I'm probably not just going to print out three MLS sheets and send them back to the lender and say, here you go. I don't believe that that's really doing your job for the seller. They asked you to, to do a grid. Please try to look at it. So, and see when you kind of go over which of these things, I mean, you know, the, the main ones are the main ones, but basically you want to make sure that you're putting things on here that would be adjusted for. They can look at the price, and if the price matches, great, but if there's something adjustable, put it on here. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And anything that you see is, is being a value factor while why your property is different than maybe comps with views or other comps. You know, whether it be, you know, view, second row of water view versus, you know, no water view, you know, fill those things out. Most of the stuff, you know, obviously square footage, bathrooms, bedroom counts. Now, typically in this market, this is a huge market, three to four bedrooms is not going to be adjusted for unless you get to the beach market where there's more value for the bedrooms. Um, but, uh, just the obvious things that you would adjust for. But explaining your adjustments too, I mean, I've gotten where there's adjustments and I'm just like, where did they come with that number from? You know, just made the numbers look good at the bottom, usually. But um, if you can explain it, you know, the more you can explain, have a paragraph along with it of why you did this, you know, would help. You know, to be afraid you know where you're coming from. Um, but mainly, I wouldn't worry about every single uh, thing to be filled out, just mainly your square footage, your room count, um, and then you know, garages, fireplace, fences. I have seen recently that some appraisers are not adjusting for fireplaces or fences. I, you know, I think they should always be adjusted for. Now, you know, it's one of the things, no builder is putting a fireplace in and not charging them for it, so um, you might as well adjust for it. Is there, a, uh, is there any place online that we can actually get these forms ourselves? Um, you know, you probably can Google, okay. you know, you know, but any lender you work with, they usually have it. Okay. Yeah, I actually tried to do that yesterday because the one that I pulled up first is my one that's all skewed and weird and everything. And I was like, oh, I know I've got the Excel one, but maybe Ted is the one that sent me that Excel spreadsheet. This one and it was amazing. So when I tried to use it, uh, third, I used it the second time for some for another one. But when I tried to go back and use it a third time, like six months later, I think the link had expired or something. But obviously we were able to print it, so maybe I'll try it again. But once any lenders, and I can send these to you too. I've got the list of emails and stuff. So if you guys want these in PDF form or whatever, I can send them to you. Okay. Um, but yeah, most of the time, if the lender wants a grid, they're going to send you the grid that they want you to use. Okay. Go ahead and use whatever they send you. But if you want to use any of these other ones, there's, there's really no difference. Um, and I know we talked a little bit about adjustments. Of course, you're very rarely going to get an appraiser who's going to tell you all the ins and outs of exactly what they adjust for. You're probably not going to find another real estate agent that will tell you exactly what they adjust for. Um, but you can talk to your brokers about that and ask them if they have guidelines. The other thing to do that I always tell people to do, especially on like a VA, if you can find uh, a, a wealth of past appraisals, especially the more recent ones, um, in your office or from your own, however many you're doing, start looking at those and start looking at what the appraisers are adjusting on those because halfway through every appraisal, when you start seeing the adjustments, you see this. This is on every appraisal. And it, it actually says what site means, what all those things mean, right? And you don't need all that on here. But the more information you have, maybe you'll understand why they're doing that. But just start looking at those. Then you have to be careful that you're really not comparing conventional to a VA one and probably not a new construction one to a 40 year old home and all that. The adjustments are going to be a little bit different. But the more you can educate yourself by looking at past appraisals, you'll see what the appraisers are doing now is more important than what they were doing, you know, during 2007 to 2015, too, because those are very different. But just know that there's all those things out there, and you can ask your brokers for, you know, hey, we have past appraisals, or if you, you know, you work with someone who does a lot of business, um, ask them, hey, can I see a bunch 
their past credit was like, really? Is that the problem with that? Officially, they didn't hold on to the lender, but if the lender gave them to you, they, I think they hold on to your firm at that point. <laughs> so, you can, uh, and that's just the, you know, that's how you can help yourself. But you can't always call me. We've got a lot of really good appraisers here. And if you do have questions on how to adjust or something, if you don't usually work with basements, if you don't usually work with, you know, third floor or something like that, start calling some of our appraisers and everything. You know, look at that affiliate business partner list and everything. They would rather you have the right information than you just be guessing. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the good one. <laughs> way, you know, so you don't set seller's expectations higher than what they can get. Everything, everything be on the same sheet of paper. Which, sorry, I'm going to interrupt one more time because that was the last class we had to teach. And please do know that if you do have, especially one of those kind of specialty properties, or you know, you and the seller are way off, like you told them this is the price and they are demanding that this is the price, you can hire appraisers to do a seller appraisal. They'll go out and do not a mini appraisal or anything like that. It's, it doesn't do 100% what like VA appraisers will look at. They can help you find value and show that to your seller as well. You know that there are people that do those things as well. And they'll go. Yeah. I think. Um, and then we kind of talked briefly before too. I mean, you fill out the grid. You're welcome to send the, I mean, you could definitely send the MLS sheets as well. Um, do whatever you want, make notes on those. I mean, you can send 20 pages of paper whether the lender passes it along or not. Sometimes they'll tell you the appraiser doesn't want to see all this. I don't know. I usually write like a little paragraph at the end, and actually I think one of these might actually be after the last one. There, I think there was a thing on the Excel spreadsheet that actually asked if you had any notes. But I usually write, like if there's a specific reason why I gave value for something or did something, that we have one house that its trusses are twenty thousand dollars more to build. Every time we build it, we always have to write that. Write a little blurb, ask the lender to pass it along. If you're just respectful about everything along the way, um, you know there are some lenders that are very black and white on, on what they say they can do. But if you send a nice note and just say, "Listen, here's my grid. These are the comps I use." But I I feel like this note is very important. I feel like it's crucial. Will you please pass on my note? The appraiser, chances are they will. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you see packets of stuff come through all the time. And it's not necessarily the appraiser saying, I don't want to see that. So, you know, you can help the lenders along with that too. You know, don't help them if everybody can come to terms. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, square footage, if you have a house that's more, it's a one and a half story, more than likely the square footage is off by at least a little bit. Um, because the county goes, if they don't go up and measure the second floor, they usually find the multiplying factors like 1.5, 1.75 based on you know, the roof line, you know, extending to the back. So I would say if you have a one and a half story, try to measure it, at least do a rough measurement yourself. If you guys know how to measure, you know, you should see this maybe off by at least 100 square feet. So that's usually the threshold that appraisers will. You know, leave with 75 to 100 square feet, depending on the size of the house, they won't adjust for it because, you know, one measures versus another. But um, I, I've seen numerous one and a half stories, bonus rooms, uh, where they were off. And that creates a problem. Sometimes it's, you know, in their favor, the house is worth more, but you, know, you guys don't want to be on that end where the seller's mad that their house is appraised for more money than they sold it for. Um, so, I always question that. I mean, you can usually look at the tax card. They'll have a semi-sketch, a base area. So you can just kind of look at, does it look like it's finished? You know, did they finish the garage? Does the county, county garage is finished or not? You can see that just on their square footage. Um, the little diagram doesn't give dimensions, but they'll tell you square footage. Uh, and if there's anything significantly off from that, I would question have you to have hire an appraiser or do it yourself to make sure the square footage is right. Another question.
back to my first statement, though, the bottom line is, you know, appraisers, we're not creating value, we're just reporting sales um, in the market trends. So pricing the houses you know, in the neighborhoods, making sure you're comparable to other neighborhoods that were historically the same, uh, would help everybody in the long run. That, that's my biggest thing that I see, pricing all over the place in different neighborhoods. Themselves if they want to, um, but uh, you 
I know, you know, if I was in that situation, I would always, when you have an appraisal in hand, you share that appraisal with the new appraiser, you know, it won't hurt. You know, see where the other person came from. Now, sometimes, you know, we have out of town people coming and comparing areas that are not comparable to others. You know, so the appraiser that's knowledgeable to the area may not take their information in. It's really hard to say, but, uh, I would think that two appraisers should be off that much. Yeah, I just have a quick, uh, just to kind of, I, I saw two uh, particular uh, models of properties that are the same identical floor plan. And, uh, you know, one appraisal measured the house just about the 14 or 15 feet difference in square footage than the previous one. Is that, is that acceptable? Is that normal? Or just in most human? 14 or 15 square feet? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, anything with under 5% difference is acceptable. Okay. Um, but, you know, just point two, you know, if we measure to tenths, you know, point two to the outside measurement could be 10, 15 square feet on the house. Um, you know, the rule is you're supposed to go to the outside corner to take away the corner boards, so essentially to the side. Uh, and then you, you know, put the rod and take away, obviously. Um, but everything's measured to the outside on um, single family. And, uh, condos are measured to the inside. So condos, you know, in North Costa Beach, those those are the tax card has a measure to the outside or what whatever the plan. They probably wrote it down whatever the plan was you know, building it. But every one of them that I've measured to the inside is smaller than what the tax card. But I know that because all the agents are, you know, listing the tax cards for it, which I don't adjust because I know that they're going to be within range, you know, those same square footage. So they're usually 100, 110 square foot difference just to the inside the outside walls. Yes, uh, the other one that always comes up with people asking us So that's, that yeah, I mean, you know, typically, you know, unless you can show that the buyers and builders are paying more for the, that lot, um, typically a one and a half acre lot means they're a cold sack or they have mostly wetlands. And so, as you know, the builders aren't giving away lots, you know, because they could have built on that extra three quarters of an acre they would have. Um, so there's usually not a whole lot of value there. You know, sometimes there are when you get to multiple acres in a large, big fence yard, you can make adjustments. If you can find sales that support it, um, but we do not, we don't usually just make it up. Typically, I tell them that's a market ability factor. If your house is nicer than the house down the street, you sell first, maybe not just get any more money. Um, but I mean, today's time, it probably would get more money because everything's you know the way it is. But um, typically, it's just a market ability factor. Um, would it matter down the road? Seller selling for that price, buyer buying for that price, and you can adjust. Do you recommend that realtors, uh, you know, take the uh, appraisal certification course just so they can have more knowledge of the appraisal? Mm -hmm. Not really. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think. You, and honestly, I don't feel like I don't feel like I learned a whole lot from. I mean, you obviously learn, but you know, once you get out of class, until you started doing filling out the report, I mean. Very, uh, I mean, had a lot of anxiety going out my first reports. You're just a lot of information. But once you've done it, you know what goes there, it makes it a lot easier. But I don't think there's a whole lot to do. I mean, maybe a measurement class to teach you how to measure. Yes, yeah, so everybody comes down on the 27th. Talk to Mary Chain. Uh, with that is for a what you said at the very beginning, they don't make value. We can to a point. That's that's our job. So 
you know, speaking to that and everything, if you're, you know, our jobs are separate. You know, the, the appraisers don't work for us, they work for the banks, they help the banks establish value to a lot of money for the loans and all of that kind of stuff. But our job is different because those in ground pools and the acreage and the retiled kitchen do have value because of what a fair market will pay, it's what a buyer will pay. And if they're willing to pay over the appraisal price, the appraisal price is just what the lender is going to loan for. Doesn't necessarily mean that's what the house is worth either. Because if it's worth more than that to a buyer, it's worth more than that to a buyer, and that's our job. So you get too wrapped up in doing other people's jobs or trying to learn their jobs, it takes away what's special about ours as well, because we are finding homes for people, but we are actually we're listening to our buyers when they say they want that pool. It's very important for them to have the tree line, all that kind of stuff, and that kind of thing can't matter on the data side as much as it does to the real estate side. So the more information you have, the better. And that's what like if you guys, you know, walk away from this class and you're like, oh I wish I would have asked him this or this is what I want to know about appraisals. Um, what that's that's what you need to come tell us because that's the next class we'll do. So I think that's the better way to to learn those sides of the thing. You know, that's why we have lenders come in and tell us about their side of things, everything. Because we need to know how to work together, but we need to know how to do our own jobs alongside them. We don't need to know how to do their jobs. Nobody has a specific question. Like I said, I mean, I'll get the email list from Better and I'll send you guys all of these. One of them was a Word doc, one was, and on the Word doc, I'm sure you could probably go in and like take out some of the fields that ever use, but I prefer to leave them in just because you may get that one house that has the, the water tower in the front yard that's a comp, and now you need to make sure that you say the view on that one, which is trick, you know, so there, there may be times where you use those lines, um, so I, I probably imagine it's just they're there for a reason, and just not going to be there for every house. Um, I guess my only other question to you originally was like the, we got one of the top ones on here, the concessions and stuff. I mean, how much does that, since they're, are they fairly standard now, so it's not really a. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, in our market, we don't, I don't adjust the concessions. Up to 4%. Anything over 4%, um, I will adjust the best, it's not typical. So um, now, now that there's you know price war, we're seeing concessions dropping. People aren't offering you know offering less, but overall markets can come back to probably around four percent. So I, I just don't. I've seen some people, other people come from outside the area from Raleigh where it's not typical and adjust for that. You know, you just you know, it doesn't make sense to me. You don't know the market. Military markets are just always that way. Concessions are kind of typical just due to the price. All right, well, thank you so much for coming in and doing this.